sort of kept me waiting for a bit to be worth it. No. David Horton, ladies and gentlemen, uh, who you may have met in May, would be helping me out with questions. He's got more answers than people look at me. As you prefer to look at him, but he's got a better, better um, more answers. Um, I'm going to avoid starting off with a speech because we don't have long. That's a tragedy of the afternoon. So um, apart from talking a bit, presumably about. Anagata. No escape. You probably want to hear a bit more about Anagata. I mean, you know all about Liverpool or Lewis or Birkenhead or whatever I came from. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll hand you over to David. So. <laughs> <laughs> I must say that I'm happy to be back. Happy to be back, especially in Sadler's Wells. I haven't seen m much more of London than, than this little corner. I'm glad to have the opportunity to do a, a bit of uh, um, brushing up, I mean sweeping up, I mean brushing up on uh, conversations that I had with ghosts here many years ago. Obviously, I'd describe myself as eclectic, others would describe me as a thief. I mean, lots of the ideas I did collect in this very theatre many years ago, originally. Uh, uh, performances of the during the golden years of the, the ballet rumbe. Let's go back to the fifties, you see. And uh, later on, Hirsi Liman, my first taste of the modern dance, dancers wearing no shoes. And the French ballet, Mirad Biskovic, the first time um, Beja have gone up in the mid since, but the first time. And was, they say that about me. The first time I saw it was. A revelation. And uh, what else? The kabuki. Would you believe? I've got a lot to answer for. Now I'm actually sitting painting my kabuki ish face in the same mirror that uh, Inuske, who is one of the greatest aligatas, uh, painted his face in the self same mirror. So I've been hoping a bit of that powder that he'd left behind brushed up on me. So it's going to be back to. Uh, Perhaps we're brushing up on uh, all the conversations, as well as useful conversations that I had experienced, either between the actor or the dancer on the stage and me in the stalls, or occasionally my visits backstage with Nicolas Servich, for example. He was the lighting designer for Alvin Ailey, and he took me around and showed me how it was all done. So to him, I also, forever. <laughs> you don't mind if I smoke, do you? It's not fair to do it without you, but I think you can do it. So, do you want to should we just ask questions? Yes, I suppose. So, yes. We'll talk about it again. I've got my pen just in case. <laughs> <laughs> they always ask me to say, well, I haven't got one, and they've always got a few books. It's there, they've always got a scratchy book. Yeah. Oh, as far as um, Alagata goes, it is, it is sort of poignant that, that um, to bring Alagata to Southern as well is what it's in fact ever since Alagata had its premiere in October. Uh, know, it was in mothballs for a couple of months. But ever since October it, it has been working to, to get it ready for Saddle as well because that's been Sort of mental goal. And so the point to bring it to San as well, which was the, the first place that he, that he saw Kabuki. Um, what was this? You, you saw your first Anagata in the bar? Or? Yeah, we were in the bar together at the same time. That, that destroyed one of, I mean, one of the first ever was Anagatas and Japanese actors. One never thought one they would be so close and it fun in the bar. The bar was being used downstairs as one of those quick change dressing rooms, obviously the Kabuki theatre itself, which is vast, vast buildings that have special rooms. And here they were obliged to do their quick changes in the bar. I was having my, you know, last minute of it's always just after the show started. And uh, he'd brushed past me 
already in his trance. It was the most beautiful thing, and it was one of the most reassuring of my experiences. There was a man who had actually become a woman, and he was about to enter the stage. He had his bullet of wig and eyelashes, was throwing back you know, the port. Well, that was actually in the trance that I had talked about and I'd read about, read through the pages of Anthony Natur, etc. But it was the most, uh, the most marvelous experience, demonstration of the trance. And he, con he continued to convince me throughout the evening. The but nonetheless, but the, 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 the first Japanese theater had been a session uh, long before that. That was when to the late 50s, early 60s. It was a bit before mm -hmm. that, actually. Oh. No, I'd been dressing up in kimonos <laughs> for a very long time. I'd always had my, my own version of the Kabuki long before I saw it, but I was a bit surprised to find that it was so much like, not my own performance, but like my dreams of what the Kabuki might have been like. But from a very early age, since my father, who was a sailor, had brought me my first kimono at the age of two, I was two. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when the letters began, the, the dialogues between the headmasters of various schools and my mother, dear Mrs. Kemp, don't send Lindsay to school wearing a kimono with all that burn cork around it. <laughs> uh, I was born with an obsession for the Orient, for the mythological Japan. And with the kimonos, I also inherited uh, the gestures. I think also that in that in uh, this is this is only my reconstruction of Lindsay's life, so he should know better. But in in South Shields as a child, in what was a fairly grim context, really, in Lindsay's terms, anyway, to have. The, old, the house full of Chinese and Japanese objects that his father had sent back. Um, it did represent for him a kind of other world, something, you know, a different possibility to, to South Shields, this, this exotic, much richer, more, more beautiful reality. And I think that something of that must, must have uh, remained doors for him, that Japan represents a kind of other reality more, more fine, more aesthetic, more intense, more beautiful. Nicer than she is. <laughs> I always fancy Japan would be nicer. It was, you see. And obviously the kimonos that I wore to school gave me more pleasure and, uh, needless to say, more amusement to my classmates and the neighbors than my uh, navy blue overcoat. And when the kimonos were finally taken away from me, I found by uh, reversing the overcoat so it revealed a red lining and then letting it out a bit. <laughs> <laughs> I was still, uh, yeah, I still had a kimono. I'm still wearing kimonos 50 years later, still dressing up and experiencing an incredible pleasure from that kind of garment and the gestures that, uh, that, that, that come with it. I mean, you've got to move that way in a kimono. I mean, you've got to shuffle along, otherwise you break your neck, haven't you? Mm -hmm. I did last night, Mary, and I just fall up on the end of the as well, so I'll be waiting for when you trip over some of the house people in my kimono. Sue over there, can you see, she's spoiling as a rather nifty little outfit. It's one of mine. It's one of yours. Oh, one of mine. Yeah, to, to, to the costumes for Ali. I love, and they do have a life of their own. They don't have to do much choreography, can't they? You know, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Also, but it's probably interesting to note that <coughs> these oriental objects and kimonos that, that were in the houses as he grew up, were, <coughs> which were presents from his father, but they were presents actually to his sister, as he had uh, a sister who died before he was born. Who was a kind of extraordinary uh, performer as a child? She went to dancing classes and she had an incredible gift for performing. And she was very much the apple of her mother's eye. 
Um, she died of she was four and a half of meningitis. Um, and Lindsay was was actually quite consciously conceived as a, as a replacement for this sister. And these kimonos and, and gifts around the house had been gifts from the father to the sister. Um, so that one can one can speculate on, on uh, psychological connections. I a chance, love. <laughs> <laughs> Followed shortly, shortly after, so he, was, he was brought into the world as a replacement for his sister, and uh, less than two years later, his father drowned at sea. At which point, for his mother, really, he had to play double role, replacing his sister and replacing uh, father, which may explain some of the, the gender complications of his work. And the obsessive imagery, the sailors, they actually came earlier. And always the drowning, the storms in the sea. You've been a bit some an ice cream room, right? If you remember, I mean, so uh, there was a storm with a drowning sailor. When I went to find the uh, the magic, the herb, it was my father who gave me the key. Recently, I, I've made it all up. What I, well, I mean, I copied it up from the Kabuki, but before the Kabuki, what I didn't know, I invented. You see. Uh, but I'd already been giving talks in the Victorian Museum, Museum about the Kabuki. I've made it up, you see. Made it up, bluffed my way. Um, uh, and then I went. And they believed in me. They, they could see the, 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 the Japanese influence in my way. They, my was very popular. And, um, and then I began to study a bit more seriously, not too seriously, but I did. I mean, preparing for this show, of course, I did go back and took my shoes off. And I did it. So they, show, they showed me how to use the fan that way, more correctly, etc. The first time was about, uh, oh, it was eight years ago. So funny, oh, I'm glad you asked me. I'm glad I remember that. Yes, we, we went to Japan with a videotape, uh, a videotape of flowers under my arm because I had heard that there was a director there that might be interested and it was the theatre. He took us to see the theatre, which was sitting just kind of rusty iron poles in, in concrete and foundations. And, um, but driving in the country, there, there, was a, the, the, there was the inauguration of the, of the temple. And the priests, the monks, were very pleased to meet, to meet us. And they said, well, you know, we're having a dance later this evening, if you'd like to come. Oh, it should be interesting. I've never heard of a Japanese dance before. And uh, we went. And they opened the doors. But there was an audience all sitting, waiting, a bit like this. I mean, waiting, and again, they expected, well, how was the dance, you see? <laughs> Unfortunately, I had my cameos with me, but there was no piano. I could do the Brahms, or you know, I could do Chopin Pro. I had my makeup just in case. <laughs> but the makeup was a kabuki makeup that I had purchased earlier in the week from a kabuki shop in, uh, in Tokyo. Head and tail of the direction. So I did my best. You know, I mixed a bit of this and a bit of that, and I got it very white and very thick. During the performance, there was no piano makeup. I mean, what Chopin and Bach there was in the show, David was obliged to play one of those very large drums, indeed. <laughs> you see them being played in this very theatre. The men are obliged to lie on their backs up there and play with it. <coughs> and uh, throughout the evening's performance, the makeup fell, <laughs> fell bit by bit. Ended up like a bit like a burning wall. No, it wasn't there anymore. The stage fell. Yeah, the stage fell, right. A bit out of Yeah, the stage fell, but the stage they had built, I mean, the temporary stage boards suspended on uh, sake barrels. And it yes, was a bit improvised, and it did. Yeah, that was the first time. And then I went back, and we performed there with the company 
about six or seven occasions. And we're going back again quite sharply. And now they've asked me to go with this. <laughs> well, they're very and I need a lot of sack. <laughs> yeah. They're very nervous. The Japanese are so extremely nervous because of the Japanese sensitivity to, to outsiders doing anything Japanese. Uh, we, we kept telling him that it was Japanese contact with him and it started off, but, but he was very worried to see how Japanese. They said that. I mean, they were very sensitive about taking Alice. You know, it was the heads. He said, "Well, you don't mind taking that bit out." You know, where they they chopped off the, the heads and then they croak. I said, "Yes, of course." He said, "Why did you say you take the heads out? Well, the Japanese are sensitive about that. Anyway, we can take." Well, it's nice to be asked to Japan. It was a it was a long time before I took flowers to to France. I mean, for one thing, I was too scared, and it wasn't ready, and it was French, wasn't it? And I wasn't asked because <laughs> 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 the English critics, as usual, say, oh, "That's not Jenny, is it?" And, uh, but we went, and what did they say? At last, Jenny comes home. It's very nice, isn't it? Then I took it. But I waited for 10 years. I waited for 10 years. I waited for 10 years these days, didn't I? Oh, dear. Um, I just read an interview with uh, William Burroughs, who went through uh, Jenny, entered his body in the uh, toilet. Do you think anything similar happens to you when you are. Uh, <laughs> 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 I feel I have his hand on my shoulder. Yes, I do, I do a bit. I feel I have his, his, his guidance. I think he helps me get, get it right. Yeah, I feel him around me. I don't feel his spirit of me, but I, I do feel him around me. Um. Thank you for the t-shirt, I got it. Did you send me a t-shirt? No. It was not to thank. I just thought it was a thank when you sent me the t-shirt. Did you get the t-shirt? What t-shirt? Um, did you have an original vision of your theatre in the beginning? And did you did have passes it now to what you originally set out to achieve? So a vision for... What, for no, when you start, 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 when you were starting the theatre, did you know what kind of theatre you were going to make? I hoped I'd make a theatre, a dance, call it. You know that. Uh, well, I always, I always danced the way that uh, I liked, and I always hoped at the same time that uh, anyone that was there would uh, would enjoy. For me, there was no such thing as enjoyment alone. It, it had to be shared. The, the dance or the theatre is always a gift for the public. So I. Uh, yeah, I did the dances that I enjoyed doing, like I'm doing now, and the dances that I, ho I hope you will enjoy uh, sharing. But I didn't uh, decide that it was going to be rather gene esque at the age of two. Or, you know, not <laughs> but then it's still, very, it's still very much like the kind of theatre that I was enjoying then. I mean, it was song and dance theatre as opposed to the theatre. Entertainment, illusion, transformation, magic, joy, music, fun. A bit like the Christmas panto, which I love. The transformation, the theatre of transformation, a theatre of dreams, which for me as a child, the theatre that I saw was a theatre of dreams. It was a magical place to be. We've lost, sadly, a lot of that magic from the theatre. Color. It's been replaced slowly, I mean, for the past 300 years, really, actually, with uh, nature. I sound a bit like uh, one of those, uh, the Strasse, 
I mean, naturalism. Yeah. Literature. Yeah. How much are you I mean, as opposed to realism. It's not theater. It's real. It's real for me. It's, it's, it's not dreams for me on the stage. It's dreams coming true on the stage for me being in San Francisco being here today. It's not a dream. It's a dream coming true with a lot of effort. I mean, I just dream it. I mean, I get the dream, the idea, or the desire, and then, uh, and then make them come true. A bit of help and sort of my own. How much were you personally responsible for the very large effects of all the movement, um, big shapes like the sea? And the sea, <laughs> keep talking about the sea. Um, and I was just talking about that and I realized that that was not my idea at all. Like this year. <laughs> 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 it, it, it was um, Claude, Claude Neville who did the lighting for this. <coughs> it was his idea. I was talking about the storm. I have, as I say, I have to have a storm in everything that I do. <laughs> <laughs> and then the sea effect. He says, oh, the sea effect. He said, well, winter. And he was talking about a bit of certain fan. Thank you. Know, I didn't and suddenly there it was, I don't think that. But the, but the set as, as a, a construction of silk is very much your idea. Oh, yeah, yes, yes, that was. Amazing, well, I promised my impresario that the next show, this one, trying to wet his appetite, I'm trying to presume to give me another chance. I said, oh, I actually, I tell us, I just pumped up. It was a pleasure to make all the ideas up as usual, I'm told right now, as I, as, I, as I went along. He said, on the set, I said, nothing, it's just curtains, just a bit of silk, it won't cost anything. <laughs> But that's why it's, it's that, and I wanted it to be a protean kind of set. I wanted it to be a bit circusy, like all my sets are. That's where I feel the most at home, and uh, have ten to travel. It was supposed to be that, and it was also supposed to evoke my early days of putting on my first shows in the backyard at South Shields with uh, you know, the the sheets and night downs for uh, curtains. And a wind machine, of course, that must be hardly by it. I was just saying that, what would I do if the wind machine broke down? I wouldn't marry them at that. What do you feel is your relation to Lewis Carroll and Alex? Well, at the moment, there was a time that I was very close indeed last season. But I think after touring with that particular production for two years, I did go up. I felt really trapped in the rectory. <laughs> and I thought, well, if I do another success, which we always hope that what well, the next thing is going to be, it's going to be something which is more myself, which is another reason why, I mean, the, the show is made up of many of my souvenirs. I had, yes, I do have a passion for Lewis Carroll, but I, I must say, I haven't thought about him much since I've been uh, in the Orient. I think at the time I made up an awful lot of excuses for doing the, the play, but I, I never really felt comfortable in the dog colour. <laughs> and not being much of a mathematician, it seemed to me, and I had to say so, but it really seemed to be a bit outside. It was only the Cheshire cat, not only because I was born in Cheshire, that you know, felt, but then it was so painful. I mean, physically it was so, but this, I think, it really hurts. But playing the cats, you know. I've gone off Carol for a bit. <laughs> when you, in, in the, that performance, the thing that struck me um, what, more than the this, this one that, no, no, not Alex. This I saw one, Alex, yeah. but this one, and then relating perhaps back to something like Midsummer Night's like Dream, and maybe even further back to something that also happened in a cruel garden at Brandon's. This sort of darkness around, that when you're there as a member of the audience, it's so rarely used. I mean, the young man over there mentioned Jeunet. Well, I saw Jeunet's The Balcony at, at the Barbican, and was horrified because the whole stage was completely lit, and I thought, well, I never imagined it like that. 
and there was no space for my imagination, my own imagination, as well as the audience. But with your, the pieces of yours that I've seen, I've not finally seen everything you've done, but you seem to have this darkness, and then small pieces are picked out. And then, of course, somehow, in these spaces of darkness, the audience's imagination can get to work, like filling in the areas, rather than having an all-over painting, something that perhaps does relate. I mean, does that relate to sort of a notion of the Eastern painting where you have the void or you, you have a sort of area which isn't described? Well, the, whether that was intentional on your part or whether it was just something. Well, the National Theatre have got more money than we have to spend on things like electricity. But it killed it. Well, they have. I mean, they've got more. They've got more lights. We can only use, you know. <laughs> so, so many. Anyway, Jenny, for instance, was written to be read by candlelight. <laughs> it, was, it was written that way. The darkness that surrounds me, I cannot escape but bring it onto the stage because that's the darkness that uh, that surrounds all of us, isn't it? And also, I'm very, uh, very influenced by the cinema, and, which is why so much of the stage I put into isolation. It, it, it's like, uh, it's like m m moving, moving shots, cutaways, jump, jump cuts, cuts. And dissolves. Yes, and yes, that was yes, it is. That was the other thing that I yes. was really struck by. I try to bring to the stage the effect of the close-up of uh, of the cinema. Clark Gable in close up, I try, it's like my face is so distorted. Big of the toe is vast, my, 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 my is so big. It is like a stretch, I'm trying to make a close up to me, but like close and maybe it feels like right in your lap. Oh, Clark Gable. <laughs> but that's why, yes, they're, they're the Well, it feels easy to tell you the truth on the stage, and I don't know why or how, but it, it flows from it. And I don't practice in front of mirrors, but the, the actor that, that played women's parts never did, certainly not in Japan, it was the other way around, the Anagata would have women come to stand still. I mean, the women would come to the Anagata to see how women should behave. And how they, they should move, and how they should make themselves more alluring. I, I, it, it seems to come naturally to me on the stage. But all the characters that you see me do, they do seem to come naturally. It's hard work when has to come to the characters. But the characters say, because they're all part of myself. Obviously, when I play a woman on the stage, it is my feminine aspect taking over the rest of my personality. The gestures are delicate, if women's gestures are delicate, because my, my body is just trained in such a way like a dancer that I can make delicate gestures are a little bit tough, tough, tough ones. So my, my training, my technique, but on the stage I become, it seems to me. I don't think about it, oddly enough. Some nights I do. Yeah, I did the other night. I caught a glimpse of myself in there, and I did. I was the first to say I looked a bit like Widow Drake. However, I was on the stage, and they said, Oh, yes, but with a bit of light, and a bit more hard on the love, I'm all right. I was mortified in some of the early videos when I was doing a tango but with a black wig, and I mean, it's not black, but the wig and the wig. And I looked a bit hoarse, I must say. I reminded myself of the transvestite sheriff in uh, Andy Warhol's Lemons and Cowboy. Putting on this kind of a I take care to shave before I thought this, and the rest is uh, relatively easy. I don't think performing, that's not easy. But maybe they or being a demon, or being a dog. <laughs> do you know yet what you're going to do next? 
<laughs> well, uh, I'll just have your friends in a minute. And I, I have, I, you know, I mean, I do find it, obviously, that I'm asked to do that. And I, I, I know, I know. After tonight, I mean, we've got a few more nights of this, then bright, you know. I've got a lot of ideas that I'm uh, working on. But uh, I have to wait until I get a date, really. You know, I mean, a uh, time, uh, a deadline, yeah. I mean, it's that only guard, and I told you, this is, it was all done and all ready. And I was so, well, you know, you open up Thursday. So then, of course, I had to get on with it. Of course, it was out of the moment. I oh, let's sleep for four nights. It took maybe, it was longer, it was a, a month's rehearsal, which wasn't very long, but you know, we don't have any subsidy, and it's expensive, the rehearsal period when no one's paying for tickets. But, as someone said before, it did take a lifetime's experience, and all the shuffling I'd done for 40 odd years, you know, did prepare me for shuffling, and I took the set as well stage. I'm working on one or two new projects here, so I don't know what to talk about. They're not secret, I mean, I mean, it's just how you talk about them, and then people say, well, whatever happened to the magic fruit fruits? <laughs> you know, we talked about the last time, the time before, I, <clears throat> so, I want to do a lot of opera, and I want to do more films, and I want to do, you know, possibly. I'm busy. I'm busy now that we've got Hannah Garcia, and you see, I mean, no one's interested in me doing anything else. Thank heavens that I like doing what I'm doing and wearing my favorite hat. <laughs> Do you, do you feel more at home with this character or with the part? Because oh no, the same, the same, the same, I'm kidding. I don't think Tony's at home with me at all, but, yeah, well, Park, that, uh, she wrote it for me. Yeah. Yeah, 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 you wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> well, my architect, yes, he did. The park is actually unique. So all the characters that they have play. Dutchman, the Reverend Charles Dutchman really was the only one I did not feel. I thought it was a bit of a lie, but I was still on I mean, I'm very fond of Narita, you know, no, she's not here today. <laughs> and then the lady that played Alice was just beautiful. I, just did, I couldn't find the kind of desire for her that, I, that, you know, that I was supposed to have, you know. Six nights a week, you know. Since <laughs> <laughs> Sasha, I want to go off, you know. Were you um, paying any kind of bleak tribute to people like Isadora Duncan and Louis Fuller? Oh, bleak! It's <laughs> 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 only the eyes that are bleak. No, the, uh, <laughs> no that is a homage to Isadora. I always wanted to dance Isadora's Duncan, to Isadora Duncan's dances, and Anna Garza enables me to do so. Did Martha Grant talk Would have been a Martha. Yeah, there was just a bit of Martha, yeah. Well, that's a bit more oblique. I'm more Isadora than I am uh, Martha. You know, I always have a great debt to Martha. And since her passing, I feel a lot more strongly influenced. Well, there aren't many of us left now, are there? I always loved Isadora, and she is with me all the time. I read her, she's won my Bibles, Isadora. I first read my life in Isadora when I was about seven. We uh, changed it. I mean, from that day to this, I knew where I want, what I wanted to be, and where I wanted to go. How much did you, you, how, um, how much did you feel rejected by the Valley establishment when they said they didn't think they'd make you become a dancer? I'm not sure I'd listen. I'm not sure I'd worry about it. They wrote to me from the then Sadler's Wells School, saying, you know, after I'd done my first audition, saying, well, we found you both, sorry, but we found you both tight since it was yesterday, we found you both temperamentally and physically unsuited to a career as a dancer. Yes, we are sending a copy of this letter to your headmaster and to your mother. Should we still be Now we listen. That's a Sula Morton talking and that. And that's still around. That's a critic to this country. Yeah, what do they do now to you? 
to riches, <laughs> loving, living, rough, brave, station. Take too long. <laughs> but the fact that you had to, you wish to survive, you had to work in so many completely different situations. Choreographed to work in the home, I work in the Dalek company. That all went synthesis of style that we have to go now, which wasn't, going back to the earlier it wasn't so much sort of a vision that, that set out, but a, but a destiny that, that became revealed that were by absorbing different influences as you went along. Right. <laughs> Just the fact, the fact that... <laughs> Coming back to that reminds me of all that, you know, it's having a really heavy drink at once. I'm going back to those same drinking places, you know, the squashed tomato sandwiches or that stale ale. Um, with your role as a woman on the stage, it was very convincing and I mean obviously that's what you do, but the fact that you each different scene that you established on the stage that evening. Um, was very convincing of someone going through life as a woman. And I was quite sympathetic towards all of that. I mean, is that what you planned on doing? Like the horse scene, I mean, the woman was like seduced by these horses. I mean, the whole time through that, I thought you were being seduced by different things. You weren't so much the demon or anything. You were very vulnerable. And each time you took a layer off, it was like you know, being seduced or, you know. I mean, was that an idea, or that just what you did? You mean going through life as a woman, you mean off the stage? Yeah, that's coming on the that stage. That would limit the fun, you see, of changing my, uh, my roles and my, my moves and my, my, sh my shape and my clothes. The fairground scene <laughs> in, uh, in, in the show comes from my first encounter with sex, as, as yeah. it did with uh, Jean Genet and Federica Gatia Lorca and, and so on, and I don't know what else in the room, but I just found the gypsies and the horses, the smell of the hay and the horse shit and the gypsies' sweat and the, the oil and all that, and the forbiddenness of the fair, the danger, the 
gypsy's vibes, the gypsy moon, and sex scene that I know about. <laughs> <laughs> but that scene is there really because it does evoke a very important part of my life and, and my uh, and my fascination that I've always had for the for the fairground, the circus, and my obsession with the for Jean Cocteau. When I came up with this show at the last minute, I had been working on a production of, uh, about the life and work of, of Sean Cocteau. I didn't finish it, I never got it done because I never found a Cocteau. I didn't want anyone to play, to play the role. Obviously, I didn't have the right shape card in this part. <laughs> and, 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 and so I, I, I didn't, I did, I did this instead, but I, I had the horses. So we put the horses in. Because I mean, <laughs> Cocteau and Jenny is, is so much part of my life. But as is Isadora Duncan, that's why they're there. I described the show. Would you say it was uh, particularly difficult to play for the British public? Or do you feel famous? Yeah, I feel British, you know. Everybody knows me here. It's a bit easier, you know, when they don't know you. Know, they don't know what to expect. They don't come with preconceived notions. And I haven't heard that you're absolutely awful and that it's an internal one and a half hours to sit through. <laughs> I'm still close. I, tell, I never read the press again. Never. I know that one shouldn't be affected. I knew we'd get around to the sooner or later. One should not allow oneself to be so affected by them. And I only just happen to read the standard. I don't quite like that. But I know I shouldn't. No, I know you should slap a vodka down. But no, I. But I did look how I ended up. But surely the standing was, was merely um, what that guy felt about himself rather than about the show that he saw. Yes, I know. I mean, that. what he said at the very end. I know, I said, said that to him. Oh, exactly. Good. Exactly. My imagination, yeah. yeah. I know, I was telling that to myself when I went on the stage as well, when the time the wires ran me like that, taking my balls out of the Dear one, well, he's got problems with himself, and it's so obvious, isn't it? Still, <laughs> there was never an interminable one and a half hour. It didn't make it easy for me to get on stage left or stage right. <laughs> <laughs> and the show's got to last an hour and a half anyway, hasn't it? And it's a pity that it did go, just went through my head. I mean, after a while, I thought, and then the applause the numbers are really I mean I don't the, uh, the critics are so um and uh, yeah representative of you I mean or of the public or even the British counterpart I like to think that all the British are nasty they are well not all the critics anyway I didn't even read the Times or the Independent Missing the independent. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I'd read that before the performance. It's silly, isn't it? And I'm toughish. I feel for little ballet dancers, you know, girls that are making the first appearance on the stage of Covent Garden, you know, or actresses, isn't there the daughter of uh, somebody in the state of another in Hollywood? I mean, I've removed Jessica. Just saying, you know, she should never be in a movie. She never has no talent, too fat, you know. It must really destroy. They just they destruct it. There was a time when we had great critics, remembering Richard Buckle and, and Peter Williams, the dance critics, Harold Hobson, of course. We've still got some good ones. I read those. <laughs> <laughs> but they were creative, weren't they? They were like creative people. They did things on their own besides you know, bitch other people, yeah. <laughs> Books. Did things. Did I ask the question? Did I? Mm -hmm. Have you seen um, one of your performances? I, don't know, I might be wrong, but I always feel like I'm transformed into a more 19th century kind of theatre because of the spectacle, um, which we don't normally see on the stage. So do you, do you ever feel it all to the 20th century? Or? Awful. Yes, I do. I really don't much care about the 20th century at all. I have some good times in it. I don't dare to be here, but I think it was better than the last century. 
I love the theatre of the last century because, like I was saying, I love the theatre of magic and transformation. So I like to use the machinery and the trapdoors. They don't have trapdoors in the theatre anymore, you know. It's all, they've all been screwed up. You can't kind of do those marvelous things, the thrills, the things. Leeds, you can. Leeds haven't been asked for Leeds for years. <laughs> I really wanted to prove to myself I wanted to do before it was too late. I could have easily not have done it, and you know, and, and, and just uh, you know, taken the, the, the jobs that hurt less, maybe, you know, directing jobs, and acting jobs, and things. But I wanted, you know, before it was too late to kind of show you what I can do, and that's why I really worked very hard, and, and I brought this show because. And not one of the others, because I, I, I had hoped. Well, it is. It, I'm not saying it's a great show by any means, but it's the best. But, um, and yeah, it is. It be better than I mean, It is an attempt to do that. And, I, and I, I, wanted, I wanted to see my name up there. I can see Marcel Marcel dreams. It's not it's a bit of egos, and obviously, you never want to be a star. And I did. I had a dream that I would be. Because you're going to have to hurry up. You know, you haven't gone long. You know, you can do more. It doesn't say Lindsay Kemp, you know, my face like it in Mass and Mass. So it does. It's got Lindsay Kemp Company. It is the Lindsay Kemp Company. No, I love working with the company, but to be absolutely truthful, yes, I did. I wanted to be up there on my. I wanted to prove to myself that I could hold an audience on, on my own. Almost everybody else, but I wanted to. I wanted to be recognized as a performer, and I'm often not. I mean, the critics, or people, if they do give it a rave review, you know, I say, yes, the costumes are lovely, it's very nice, and the costumes are very nice. But it doesn't often talk about my own performance. So I, uh, I want to be a memorable, useful performer. Yeah, I want to be stuck. Would you like something to be famous? I want to be famous. Would you like some favorites of your own, of your shows? Or are they the favorites that you are performing at the time? Not usually at the time, no. I love doing it with the flowers. Yes, and the jeans. And the jeans. Mm -hmm. It's sad that we haven't done it. You haven't done missed. that. Yeah. Yeah, and there's anything anyone missed in anything else, but it was just an anagata. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Is there any... And the Jinsky I loved, and I am going to do the Nijinsky next soon. But it's, I, can't say, I'm, I can't say it's one of my favorite shows, because it's so um, painful to perform. And they talk about my self-indulgence, you know, I'm not a masochist. I'm not. It hurts too much to perform that play. Very long, and so did Salome come to that. I'd really like to find a play where I make everyone laugh. And that thing. Maybe that's what I should have said. I'm waiting for my bit. <laughs> Is there a chance that we might see you in Salome again? Yes. Yes, there is. I really don't know when, but uh, I'd like to do that again as well. I don't play the part. Someone said I said I wanted to play Herod, and of course I could. But I did like to play Sarah. It's a bit cheap, but Sarah had one leg. She only had one leg. Oh, good. If she could do it with one leg, I could do it with scarcely two. <laughs> I would like, maybe with another salon there. I have a few ideas, but I would like. Yeah. It's very decadent, isn't it? It's 
How do people feel when they come away from something? You saw it, you know David Plato. You're hacking up. He's not actually on the stage in this physically, but I have his head. <laughs> his head. So, less painful than when I have my head in drills. <laughs> right. So it's David performance stage. Because I remember David at the Roundhouse. In Salome. In Salome. Yes. Do you perform it? I'm not in this. I do. I, I, sort of occasionally get called upon to emergencies. But it's not only an emergency. <laughs> well, I occasionally say yes to emergencies. I was nearly on for a horse the other day. Yeah, he did. <laughs> <laughs> already I thought you really made it happen. This time I cheated. I just had my marks go to the stage. a lot, a lot of Spanish music, and I couldn't find the right kind of music. And Douglas McNichol, one of the boys, brought me that, uh, that a tape with a lot of Spanish music about this particular scene. I thought, sit and look at the music, and we rehearsed it. And then someone then said, this is beautiful, the Lord's Prayer. And it is, in fact, a flamenco version of the Lord's Prayer, which is perfect for that uh, particular scene. There are other scenes like uh, the beginning, the same Matthew Passion from the very beginning. Both ideas came at the same time. The storm, the same Matthew Passion, flying around. That came at the same time. And the end, the, the, the Strauss. I knew I was going to fly up at the end. I mean, I knew I was going to fly in at the beginning and fly to the end. The middle bit, I was going to show I always have the beginning and the end. You've got to have that one to start with, especially at the end. Marcus end. You <coughs> start with the end and then from the beginning. And, uh, yes, so, uh, uh, and then I, um, I heard the Strauss on the radio. And you know, it didn't seem familiar. It just seemed I knew it was Richard Strauss, but I, I, I wasn't very familiar with the song. And, uh, and I, I just tried to sing the song, you know, in the local music shop. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> and, and then looking through my stress for something else, it, it was on the back, wasn't it? I was on the back of the, you know, very scratched Salome dance, which is a beautiful dance and stuff. And I'd never, never played it. Are you sure about that? Virgil wrote it, you see. The, the original music had written some music for the end, which he was very fond of. And it was very nice, but. Well, Strauss, and this is the Richard Strauss is so perfect. It helps me, I use great music when I can. Because, well, it helps get me there, isn't it? Going to heaven. When music is so important to me, it is the most direct route to heaven. And the ideas, they came from all over the place. Some of mine, some of somebody else's. But I put them together, and David kept me working on this. Let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. 
I was told at a very early age that it's not good manners to talk about yourself. <laughs> I never stop. I never, my mother would be mortified. <laughs> I think it's, it's um, important to, to remember that Lindsay's is a sort of a non, uh, non purposeful one. It doesn't program his activities. So that really, chance, as a word, plays a large part and doesn't have a systematic way of preparing things or working. It's a long process of absorbing lots and lots of ideas, whether it's music or, or video or Japanese things or all kinds of things, books, everything. It just keeps on digesting, digesting, and then the ideas pop out, and then gradually they get put together and knocked into shape and then thrown out and put back in again in another shape, another place. So it's, it's sort of chaotic and unpredictable. But that's, uh, yeah. It's charming. It's charming. It's very charming. Everything. I wanted it to be beautiful. Everything that's that's what I thought I wanted to do something that is beautiful. I don't care whether it's got a story. I know that a story helps. It does. I mean, so there is a bit of a story. But I was just hoping that I could enchant an audience with, with beauty. Or poetry in the theatre. That's really what. And I didn't worry too much about the, the meaning of a lot of the effects. They have a meaning for me on the stage once I'm, you know, prancing around on that blue cell. Of course, I'm drowning there, but I wasn't planning on drowning. <laughs> I ordered, you know, like 60 meters of on the cell. Not much choice. Did you ever find it difficult to actually visualize what it must look to, how it must look to someone who was in the audience? No, that's how I see it. I'm going to be sitting over there. Yeah, that's how you see things, isn't it? Yeah, I can see me that I've done fabulous. <laughs> but I get out there and it's not quite the same. <laughs> I see myself as I'd like to see myself in sitting, uh, you know, in a posh seat. I'm being absolutely astonished. I was endeavoured to astonish. I think an artist has a responsibility to astonish. <coughs> Not to shock. The English critics are so fond of saying I was about to be shocking you to be in any But to astonish. Yes. Lindsay, why have you chosen Rome to live, of all places? Why, why Rome? Of all places, because it is the most beautiful city in the world, and I'm happy living there. It's a free place to live. They like me there. I know. The things taste better, and they look better, and I'm afraid to walk down the street, you know. You seem to have got more credit than most spending money. Success, so <laughs> much Oh, yeah. Than here, really. Were you living in Barcelona one time? Yes, I lived in Barcelona for about five years, and that was also very useful, but I didn't fall out of love with Spain. I just fell in love with, with Rome anyway. I first lived in Rome many years, six years ago, and I decided then that one day I'd, I'd have a house in Rome. I was dreaming again, but uh, thanks to Japan, mm -hmm. a few gigs over there, and, uh, it's a poem. It's living in a romantic poem. And having Keats and Shelley just around the corner. It's very nice. Very nice. It is a lot of nice. I'm happy to be back here. Do you live near the Spanish steps, then? Not far. <laughs> <laughs> I live around the corner from the Colosseum. Anyway, another reason for living there, I mean, amongst all those ruins, is that makes me feel quite happy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have 
loving you. Know, I hate to have to go. And I'm sorry it was so short, but I know you all want me to give a better performance tonight. So you get ready for that. Is there anything else? They did that anything else. We didn't come around afterwards, you know, you know, you're all as well. No more questions than that. So, a big thank you to Lindsay and to David. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have you.